Well, good afternoon. And uh, we want to welcome you to our Tuesday live question and answer program. My name is Rick McFarland. I'm the Dean of Faculty here at Karis Bible College. And so we are going to answer some questions that came in on Andrew's last Tuesday night Bible study and didn't have time to answer all those. And so we're going to answer a few of them today. And uh, so let's get, uh, hop right into this. Let's take a question from Vicki on YouTube. Vicki says, I'm believing God for healing and I speak to the situation. Do I still have to speak the promises over and over again uh, over my life? And so actually, that's a, that's a very good question, Vicki. We don't need to confess the promises that God. So many Christians, when they're confessing the scripture, they'll quote verse after verse after verse at God. God, you said. God, you promised. God, you said. And really what we're trying to do is we're trying to convince God or, or subconsciously trying to get him to move. And so really, confession of the scriptures is biblical. But why do we confess the scriptures? The confession of scripture is really for us and then for the circumstances that we face. And so we need to understand that we don't need to convince God to move. He's already moved. And all of his promises are yes and amen. So 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For all the promises of God in him are yes and in him amen to the glory of God through us. We don't need to quote God's promises to God since he's already said they're yes. And so, so if I'm not to confess the scriptures that God, then why, you know, how should I confess them? It's a great question. So first of all, there's what's called the confession unto faith. In Romans 10, 17, it says, then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And your ears are closer than any other ears to your mouth. And so, uh, and so it's important that you speak the word of God. Because your ears are going to be listening to the Word of God. And so that's part of meditating the Word. Speaking the promises of God. Confessing them slowly. Meditating on them. Speaking them. And you get to a place to where that becomes revelation in your heart. That's when faith comes alive in your heart. Faith is stimulated. And then we have what's called the confession of faith. And again there's the confession unto faith. That's hearing the Word and confessing the Word so that we get to a place to where faith in our heart is stimulated by it. But then once we have that belief in our heart and it's alive in our heart, then we need to release our faith to the circumstance, to the healing, to, I mean, to the sickness, to the financial act, to something in the natural. And so 2 Corinthians 4.13, Paul the Apostle says, and since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed, therefore I spoke. We also believe in therefore speak. You need to release your faith. And so God told us to speak to the mountain. He didn't say speak to God about the mountain. He says speak to the mountain. So many Christians are speaking God's word to God instead of the mountain. And subconsciously they're trying to get God to move, but he's already moved. So that's a good question. And so let's move to the next question. This is from Francisco on Facebook. He says, please explain how God the Father disciplines his children. And so that's a great question, Francisco. You know, uh, religion would teach that, you know, God dis disciplines his children by cancer and by sickness and by storms and by calamities and stuff like that. You know what that's called? If, you're, if a natural father did that to his own family, that's called child abuse. And so God is not into child abuse. So how does God discipline his children? And we're going to find out that God disciplines his children through his word, the word of God. Look at 2 Timothy 3.16. 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for four things. First of all, doctrine, that's teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And so God uses His Word to correct us. And I don't know about you, but there's been times when God's been dealing with me and I just open my Bible, look down in the a verse, it's talking about the issue that God's trying to talk to me about. And so I close the Bible, get in my car, turn on the radio, and Joyce Meyer or Andrew's talking on that verse. And you know, I go to church and pastor gets up and he's talking on that verse. And I don't know if you've done that, but God uses His Word to get through to us and to correct us. And so the Word of God is for our correction. Correction is not always pleasant, but we need to yield to the Word of God and, and receive its correction. Because if we don't yield to the Word of God, then our consequences is going to discipline us. And we're going to find out that when you, when you operate in the flesh, there's consequences from your flesh. And so look at Galatians 6.8. We're going to talk uh, we're going to find out that uh, our flesh can bring consequences, that we can be disciplined by our consequences, but it's not God doing it. Look at Galatians 6.8. It says, For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh 
reap corruption. That's decay, that's harm. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Did you notice in this verse it does not say, for he who sows to the flesh will reap from God corruption? No, it says from the flesh you'll reap corruption. And so again, God wants us to be disciplined by the Word, be corrected by the Word, make the adjustments when the Word comes. But if we don't heed the Word, then our consequences oftentimes will, uh, will end up disciplining us. And so I'd rather be led by the Word and corrected by the Word. I don't know about you. So next question, Vince on chat asks, what do you think of a common practice of the pulpit that stays away from any topic that's considered political. And so ministers ought to teach and preach from the Word of God. And the Bible talks about every major issue that we're dealing with today as human beings, the Bible touches on it because no problem we have today is anything new. Uh, we've had it uh, from time past. And the Bible talks about the key issues that we deal with every single day. And so we should be ministering from the Word of God. But many ministers, some ministers, are not teaching and preaching what the Bible says on different issues that impact us today. Now, I don't know why, but most of the time I would think it's out of fear of losing people or being unpopular with people. But we need to preach and teach the Word of God. And when we do that accurately, you're going to touch on those issues and you can't skirt around it. You know, I'm a pastor myself and I pastor a church and I teach verse by verse book by book. And I don't have the luxury to skip over verses, skip over issues. And so I'm teaching what the Bible says line by line. And so I do encourage you to find a church that teaches the Bible and makes practical applications to the issues that face our life. That's a good question. And so this is from Phyllis. The next question is from Phyllis on YouTube. She asks, is there a difference between the gospel uh, and uh, good, the good news? So is there a difference between the good news and the gospel? Actually, the word gospel comes from a Greek word, actually comes from a compound Greek word, a combination of two words. The first word means good, and the next word means message. And so you put those two together, the word gospel in the Greek is good message or good news. And that's where we came at. So it's exactly the same thing. The gospel is good news. And that brings out the fact that we are to preach and teach the gospel. And when you preach the gospel, you're preaching good news. If you're preaching bad news, you're not preaching the gospel. Look at Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Romans 1.1, 1, 1, Paul here says, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to meet an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Look at that word separated. The word separated means to mark off with boundaries. And so Paul was called to be an apostle and he was marked off with boundaries to the gospel. That meant that if Paul was preaching anything but the gospel or anything but good news, he was out of bounds. He was, he was out of the boundary that God set. And so if some ministers preaching the law or preaching bad news or harm or, or, or bad news, then that's not the gospel. And so again, we should be preaching the good news that Jesus lived a perfect life for us. And that He died on the cross, bore all of our sins, past, present, and future. Now God will move and bless your life, not because of your performance, but because of Jesus' perfection and His righteousness. And that's the good news. And if we're preaching a message that's opposite than that, then, then we're out of bounds. That's a great question. Let's move on to the next question. Matt, or Mike, I'm sorry, on chat asked, how do I know which ministry to join? And so that's a good question. There's two forms of guidance. There's general guidance. That's the Word of God. That's God's will for every person, which, for instance, the Bible says that uh, if you like to eat, then work. That's God's general will for you is to have a job. And so that's, that's the general will of God. The Word tells us that. But the Bible doesn't say where to work. It didn't say thou shalt work at Walmart. You can't find that in Scripture. You may find that, that, that in the book of Hesitations. I'm joking. There's no such thing. But, but how does God lead us in the particulars of life? Where to work? Well, look at Psalms 37, look at verse 4. It says, delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Now, for years I thought this verse says, if I just delight myself in God, He'll just give me whatever I want. Actually, this is not what this verse is saying. The verse says that if you delight yourself in the Lord, He shall give you, put within you, plant within you the desires of your heart. And so he'll put a desire in your heart. So 
when you want to be led specifically by God, you need to follow the two P's that he puts within. This is not the vegetable, it's the letter P. The first P is passion. That's the desire. As you delight yourself in the Lord, you're just loving him, worshiping him. Now this won't work if you're living in the flesh, but if you're serving God, love God, and the closer you draw to God, he will put those desires in your heart. You can follow those because those are God-inspired desires or passions he puts within you. Then the second P is peace. And so the passion's the what of the will of God. And P is the timing. The peace is the timing. And so God's going to give you peace. And so, you know, you can have a desire for a certain thing that God had put in your heart, but you think you can still lack peace. Why? Because it's not time yet. And so either you're not ready, the people aren't ready, the circumstances are not ready. So you need to follow those two things that God puts in your heart, passion and peace. If you follow those two, if they're two working together, you're going to find the, the will of God for you specifically. That's a great question. Next question is from Pinch of Salt. I like that. Pinch of Salt on chat. Ask, how do we get over the lump of the belief that Jesus is God and then excuse our not doing the things Jesus did, like healing, raising the dead by saying, well, Jesus did it because he was God and we're not. And so that's a great question. And so Jesus is and was God. He was God and he is God. And, and Jesus, uh, Jesus is God and made manifest in the flesh. So Jesus came in the flesh. And so he was 100% man, but he was also 100% God. And so he didn't cease being God as a human when he walked the earth. But what he did do is he emptied himself of the privileges of operating in all the attributes of God. And so look at Philippians 2. Look at verse 6. We're going to look at a couple verses here. Philippians 2, 6 says, who, the speaking of Jesus, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made of himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Look at that word, no reputation. In the Greek, it means he emptied himself. It's a Greek word which means to empty. He emptied himself. Well, what did he empty himself of? The privileges of operating in the attributes of, of deity. And so what are some of the attributes of deity that he laid aside and didn't operate in as a man? Well, I'm going to list two of them right now. The, the first one's omnipresence. Omnipresence. That means being in the same place at the same time, being everywhere all at once. And so Jesus, when he became a man, was limited to one place at one time. And if you wanted to get to Jesus, you had to find where he was to be ministered to him. The next attribute was omniscience. That means to know all things. And so God knows all things. God is all present. But when Jesus became a man, he, he was God, but he laid aside those attributes. And so we find out that uh, Jesus told his disciples to pray for laborers to the harvest. Why? But, well, couldn't Jesus just go everywhere at once? No, he was in a human body. He could only go one place at one time. And so he prayed for other laborers because the harvest was too much for him to physically get to. And so we find... In John 10, 11, in verse 14, Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. But I want you to see something. After Jesus rose from the dead, he's called something else. He's called the great shepherd. And so look at Hebrews 13, look at verse 20. It says, Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of everlasting covenant. How could Jesus go from good to great? I thought Jesus was the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is. But he was a good shepherd in his earthly ministry because he can only be one place at one time. You would have to press to the crowd to touch him to get your need met. But after he rose from the dead, he sent his spirit into the heart of every believer. And now his spirit goes with you wherever you go. And now he's a great shepherd of the sheep after he's been raised from the dead. And so, uh, you know, Jesus didn't know everything in his earthly ministry. Oftentimes he asked questions because he didn't know the answer. He asked a, a father about his son having a demonic attack. And, and he asked, how long has this been happening? That's Mark 9, 21. He asked the disciples on um, feeding the crowd. He asked, how many loaves do you have? That's Matthew 15, 34. Jesus was hungry one day, went to a fig tree to see if it had fruit or not. That's Mark 11, verses 12 and 13. Why, why do we bring this out? Because he, did, he laid aside his omniscience. He had to either get a gift of the word of knowledge to the Holy Spirit or find that information out. So this brings out that Jesus did everything he did by faith as a man, anointed by the Holy Spirit. 
And so as a man, he operated by faith and the aid of the Holy Spirit. Do you know as a born again Christian, you have the exact same resources. You have the faith of God and you have the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus didn't operate because he was God. He didn't heal people because he was God. It was because he was anointed by the Holy Spirit and he trusted God and led by faith. Actually, John 14, 12, Jesus said this, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also and greater works than these he shall do because I go to my father. So we can't use that excuse. Well, he was God. He did that. No, he was a man anointed by the Holy Spirit. Yes, he was God, but he didn't operate in those, those attributes as God. Great question. Let's go to Tiffany on chat. What do you do when sometimes you feel like you believe God is real, but other times you're not so sure? My faith was shaken to its core in college, and I have gone back and forth ever since. Let me say something to you, Tiffany. Actually, all people believe in God. Oh, no, pastor, there's atheists out there. You know what? There's no true atheists because look at Romans chapter 1, look at verse 18. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. There's a truth that people suppress. That means to hold down. And so, not to let it consciously come to their minds. They suppress. What truth do they suppress? Look at verse 19. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. What truth do they suppress? That there's a God. There's a God out there. And so let me, Andrew brings this out. He was in, the, in Vietnam. He brings this out. He met some that said they're atheists, but you know what? Andrew says there's no atheists in foxholes. When the bomb starts dropping, all of them were crying out to God because they know in their heart what was being suppressed popped up out of, the, out of their heart and they knew that there was God. Look at Psalms 14, verse 1. What do you call someone who teaches someone else that there is no God? Like a university professor who says there is no God out there. What, well, the Bible calls him by a term. What term does the Bible use? Look at Psalms 14, look at verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that does good. This, this verse brings out that if you say there's no God, you're a fool. And so, really, this also brings out, why do people say there is no God? This verse explains it. It says they are corrupt. They've done abominable works. So, why do people say there is no God? Because they know that they're guilty, and they, know they don't want to face that they're accountable for their actions. So, they'll just shove that down and say, there is no God. They put their hands over their ear and go, no, 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 there is no God. But down in the deep part of the heart, they know there's a God. And so, again... <clears throat> If someone teaches that there's no God, they are a fool. And there's people in, in, uh, in universities all over America and around the world that teach, are teaching students that there is no God. And so, again, one look at creation can tell you that there is a designer, there's a God. Look at the macro universe and then go look into the micro universe of the atom and the cell and the DNA. And you see extremely uh, incredible amount of design everywhere you look. And a design speaks of a designer. And so, uh, Tiffany, we, you need just to make a decision. Are you going to take the Bible as the Word of God or not? You have to come to a demarcation that the Word of God is, is true and, and follow the Word of God in your life. And then once you make that decision, you don't look elsewhere. You don't open your mind and, and, and entertain those thoughts because your faith will become shipwrecked. Hebrews 1.2 says, In these last days God has spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, through whom He also made the worlds, who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, and upholding all things by the word of His power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The Word of God should be first place in your life. Do you know the Word of God is actually what's holding everything, holding creation together? It's the Word of God. And so you need to make a decision, Tiffany. You know what? I am not going to entertain uh, fools trying to tell me there is no God when my conscience tells me there's a God. You wouldn't have sent this question in if you weren't dealing with that knowing that there was a God on the inside of you. When you're looking around and you see a birth of a baby and you see the design of the human body and you see the glory of the majesty of creation, 
And then, but you know, you need to go to the Word of God. The Word of God tells you there's a God. He tells you that there's a Son, Jesus Christ. And there's a way to God, and there's a way away from Him. There's a heaven and there's a hell. And so you need to make a decision, Tiffany. Am I going to believe God's Word? And I'm going to shut my ears to fools that would teach me otherwise. And so those are great questions. And so I'm going to pray for you. Father, I just thank you for those listening. And Lord, I thank you for blessing them with the Word of God and through the Holy Spirit. I thank you, Father, for your goodness in their lives in the name of Jesus. Jesus. So thank you for joining us today and join Andrew and Carrie tonight on the live Bible study. And at six o'clock they'll come on and, and just bless you. And then we'll be back next Tuesday afternoon to deal with some questions. So God bless you. Have a wonderful day.